some of you don't know, that every Sunday we have services, dual services with us in, here in the United States and also in Pakistan at the same time. In fact, many times they have more people than we do. But it's very exciting and I'm so proud of, of my brother and my son, uh, not only son in the faith, but he's become my adopted son, Robinson, Sadiq, and uh, Snyder. And uh, his children are my grandchildren, and, and I, my children, he, they're his brothers and sisters. And, but you know, in truth, that's the way it is with all of us. We all have the same father. And, and I look at Robinson and the people that he's already influenced, and now they're influencing people. This is the way it goes. This thing is spread. You can't contain the love of God. And just a moment ago, uh, Rahil John prayed for us here. And, and I'm so proud of Rahil. Rahil's a young man. And, and all these other folks that, that I, I don't know all their names, but they're, they're my family. They're my family. And when I get to Pakistan physically at the end of March, it'll be like I've always been there. And it's the same way when you go someplace in the Lord, which is every place we go in the Lord, God has it all worked out. And it's, it's, He goes before us and He, he does everything. Well... Having said that about the going before, we're going to look at something today that I think, I hope it excites you. It did me. So much so that when I was reading it, just in my daily Bible reading, I thought, boy, this is a message here. And then I read it again and it started writing down things, not so much taking notes for a message, just taking notes, period. And there were so many things. And in fact, it turned into so much, I thought, I'll never get that in. And... and then God began to show me how that this story of Abraham, his servant Eliezer, his son Isaac, and his soon-to-be daughter. Now, you may say daughter-in-law. It was actually his daughter because they, she was coming into the family. His daughter-in-law, daughter, Rebecca, who was going to become the wife of uh, Isaac. The story of Abraham obtaining a bride for his son Isaac. It's a real story. By the way, this title, I'm just going to give it a title, The Selecting of a Bride. Now, I'm going to show you that not only is this story real, but it really happened, but it's also symbolic. It's a picture of our being chosen by God to be the bride of Christ and to be God the Father's children. Rebecca was chosen. You were chosen. God went before in the person, uh, he, the Bible says, Abraham told Eleazar, he's going to send an angel in front of you. He's going to prepare the way. Well, I'm going to show you the symbolism here. We're going to see that Abraham is like the father. He's a type. He's not God the Father, but he's a type. We're going to see that his servant, and the Bible says that he's the oldest servant in the household, which is Eleazar. He's like the Holy Spirit. He's going before, and he's the one that's wooing. Eleazar is like the Holy Spirit. Both the Son and the Spirit, we're going to see, bow to the will of the Father. You say, well, are they less than the Father? No. It's just the way that it works. God the Son doesn't do anything that God the Father doesn't tell Him to do. Is that because He's less? No. It's just who He is. Isaac, we're going to see, represents Christ. And we're going to see some things that are very interesting here. <laughs> Isaac was born of an impossible birth. This, by the way, this is Genesis chapter 24. Isaac was born of an impossible birth. His mother was way past the age of childbearing. And yet, God told Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham, that he was going to be the father of this great nation. And his descendants were going to be greater than the stars. And the Bible says that Abram believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. All right. Isaac was born of an impossible birth. When Abram told Sarah that she was going to be a mama, she laughed. She laughed. She was way past the age of childbearing, and yet she did give birth. Jesus was born of an even more impossible birth. See the types here? He was born of a virgin. Sarah was way too old to have children, and she did. Mary, Jesus' mother, was just basically a child, and she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Literally, God was the Father, and she gave birth, an impossible birth. The Father had to open Sarah's womb. She was 90 years old, 
God is the one who opens wombs, and God is the one who closes wombs. Well, I want us just to read in Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to read a bunch of scripture today. Some of it I'll make comment on, some of it I won't. But we're going to have to go quickly because we're going to cover this whole chapter. Obviously, we can't do that and look at every verse. But I'm just going to read the first nine verses. Now, Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abram, Abraham in every way. Now, that word Lord right there, that is Yahweh. That is the same person as Jesus. Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am. The word Yahweh, as it shows here, is I am. Verse 2, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, that's Eleazar, who had charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. When he said, place your, your hand under my thigh, that literally means, gosh, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, the loins is what he was saying, the place of birth. This is a very serious thing. It would be similar to the circumcision. The circumcision, when there was a cutting away of foreskin, what that meant was they're, they're from the, from the life-producing organ, he's taken away the flesh. That's what circumcision means. It's a picture of what's happened. The old you is gone. There's a new you. There's the you that is in Christ. That's the real you. Okay. Verse 4. But you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Verse 5. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Now I want you to see verse 6 and we're going to see it again in verse 8. Then Abraham said to him, Beware, look at what he said, Beware that you do not take my son back there. Do not take my son back to that land. We left that land, we're not going back. There's a picture there for us. We have left who we were and where we were, and not only are we not going back, but here's the good news, we can't go back. Now we can act like we're back, but that's not us. Okay, verse 7. The Lord Yahweh, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. If you'll notice here, he's telling him what's going to happen. He's not telling him what could happen. I believe that God had already put this on his heart. Now, this was Abram, Abraham telling him what he was going to do. This is the picture of the Father sending the Holy Spirit to get a wife. That's exactly what he did for you. The Father sent the Holy Spirit, wooed you, drew you in, and I'm going to show you how he does that, so that you can become the bride of Christ. When was this done? From eternity past. Do I understand this? No. Who was this done for? Well, we're going to see that in a moment, and it's going to excite you. Verse 8. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning this matter. All right. The sending of Eleazar. Now this was this covenant made between Eleazar and Abram. Now I want to show you what this is. This is like a covenant on your behalf. There was a covenant made. But it was made between God the Father, Christ the Son, and God the Holy Spirit on your behalf. If you'll notice, Rebecca had nothing to do with this covenant. Nothing. She was totally on the receiving end. The covenant was made with the triad, the, the, the trinity. The family of God was making a covenant with each other on your behalf, on my behalf. Now this is very, very exciting. Rebecca has not entered into the scene at all, and yet the covenant's already made. Pretty big deal right here. Verse 6 and 8, I told you, he said, Whatever you do, don't take my son back there. He did not want him going back to what he'd left. He did not want him marrying a Canaanite woman. I don't know all the significance of that, but he said she's going to marry one of the family. All right. In verse 7, Abraham said that God would send an angel to prepare the way. Now, the Holy Spirit is not an angel, but this word angel right here can be used differently. It's not just a messenger or a minister. 
This is like a ministering spirit. And when you talk about the angel of the Lord, we're talking about Yahweh there many times. This time, I believe he's saying, I'm going to send my spirit in front of you, and he's going to prepare the way, and when you get there, it's going to be easy. And I want to say this. If it's not easy, I'm not saying there won't be labor. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But if things that you're involved in are not easy spiritually, then there's a good indication maybe I ought to examine, is God really in this? Is this what God wants me to do? Jesus said, my yoke, I mean, my load, I got it, I'm going to get it in a minute. He said, my yoke is easy and my load is light. If it's not easy and it's not light, then it's probably not Jesus. That doesn't mean you won't get tired laboring in the ministry. You will physically get tired. But people say, I felt like quitting. Well, everybody's felt like quitting at one time or another, but you don't. Why? Because you can't. Because it's who you are. It's not what you do. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws. He's the one who prepares the way. He's also the one who goes before us. This angel, it's a representative or messenger of God. The second thing we're going to see in verse 10, let's read verse 10. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Now it doesn't mention here, over toward the end of the chapter, it does mention. It took a lot of men to go with him to look after all of this. This was a 500 mile trip on camels through not the most easy land in the world. A lot of desert land, not much water. They had to take all they ate along the trip. They had to take most of what they drank along the trip. And they took all these gifts that they were taking with them. Well, the gifts are prepared to be given. Took ten camels, a variety of good things to the master's uh, house there from his, the master's hand. Can you imagine all the gifts they put on those camels? Ten camels? Couldn't take all that would be given. It was impossible to take all that was given. Why was it impossible to take all that was given? You know, because everything was given. All that belonged to the son was given to Rebecca. What belonged to the son? All that the father had had been given to the son. Now this is even going to be bigger than this in a minute. What I'm going to show you toward the end is unbelievably exciting. All that the father had had been given to Isaac. And now all that Isaac had was being given to his bride. The bride didn't understand this. And he took some great gifts, but the gifts were a mere token, a mere down payment of what was to come. Couldn't take it all. It was so great, this was just a sampling of the gifts. They would become hers when... When were they going to be hers? Okay. He, what would you say? When they were married, I, let me say this, as far as God is concerned, they were hers even before they even knew who she was. They were hers when they were given. When did all the gifts of the Father given to Christ, given to you, when did they become yours? I used to say, when I believe. No, that's not true. The gifts were on the camel. The gifts were hers. All she had to do was believe that they were hers and receive them. They were already hers. They were already hers. They would become hers when they were given, not when she took them. They were hers. Now this is just like us. What we think we have now is only a small sampling of what we possess, just like that little four-year-old girl that I was telling you about, the one with brain cancer, Valerie Grace, this wonderful, sweet, dear little girl. I've got a picture of her sitting in my lap when they were here visiting one time. And when she was four years old, she looked at her mama in the car. Between one of their trips, they went to St. Jude's. They went all over. She's had multiple surgeries, multiple treatments. And she looked at her mama and she said, Mommy, Jesus really misses me and I really miss him. Now what four-year-old would say that? And then she said to her little girl, the mo mother did, she said, well, you can talk to him now. And the little girl said, yes, I know, but it's not the same. I believe this little girl had personally probably sat in the lap, not only of the preacher, but I believe she probably sat in the lap of the one who loves her, Jesus. I don't understand all that. And I'll tell you what, there are, many, there are not many people on this world who do understand that, but that four-year-old understood. That four-year-old understood because she'd had a special encounter. 
People say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you believe what you want. But I'm telling you, you'd be missing it if you don't believe it. This is not only real today, this picture, but it's real for us. This is the same way that Jesus feels about us, these gifts that He's given. Well, in verse 11 through 14, there's a plan that's put together. There's a plan that's hatched. Let me read verse 11 through 14. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well. He's already there. That was a quick 500 miles on Camelback. Need by outside the city by the well of water at the evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, O Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham. Now look at that. This time he calls him the God of my master Abraham. The next time we're going to see him pray, he's not going to be praying to the God of his master. He's going to be bowing before his God. You see, God was using this in a personal way. Move away from the symbolism right here. But God was using this in a personal way in the life of Eleazar. O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant my success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. He prayed. I prayed, I'm sorry. And then in verse 13, Behold, I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. And now, may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, Drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and by this I shall know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Well, he prayed, and he said, Grant the success. I'm going to say this, the success here was not based on what Eleazar did. The success here was granted on what God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit did. I believe when he prayed, God put this thought in his head about how he should pick out the right one. God is the one who picks. Now, who has God chosen? I'm going to tell you this. This is just a little aside, a little extra. He's chosen you. But he's chosen everyone. He's chosen the world because that's who he loves. That's free. God gave the idea after he prayed, Ask her for water. She said yes, and then she was going to water his camels. This would be a great amount of work. Can you imagine with one jar how long it took to give all the men that were with him water and all the camels, not just the ten camels that were holding the gifts, but the camels of the men. And camels drink a lot. That's why they can go a long time. They drink till they're filled, and then they can go a long time. So we're talking a lot of water. This may seem like like her and, and like uh, uh, Eliezer are working something out, but it's not. It's not. This was of God. Well, in verse 15 through 20, we see that his prayer was answered. It came about before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful a virgin, and no man had relationship with her, and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him to drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all the camels. Now this is a pretty big deal right here. God answered the prayer literally while he was praying it. You know why that works like that? Because God puts the prayer on your mind. God literally sends the prayer from heaven to you. And you pray it back to God. God is is the one that's involved with prayer. God is the one that's even telling us how to pray. Well, he answered the prayer even before he finished asking it. When God is in whatever we're doing, this goes back to what I said before, it will seem easy. You say, well, this was just a coincidence. One of the things that I used to do, and I'm not recommending doing this, I'm just telling you how I used to do it. When I would be on the city streets of Memphis, Tennessee, when I was in seminary and we had to go out witnessing, and they wanted us to hand out tracts. And we actually kept up with the number of how many tracts we handed out. Handed out 2,147 tracts today. Oh, aren't I something? That's ridiculous to do that, but that's what we did. But how do you talk to somebody when you give them a tract? Well, here's what I used to do. And this worked for me. And I used to say, and I didn't even understand what I was doing. Now I look back on it and think that it was God. I used to say, this is something that tells you how much Jesus loves you. 
At least I was doing that right by saying, you're a sinner and you need to get saved. That's what others would do. That's what I'd even done. But I said, this talks about how much Jesus loves you. And I'd give them the track. I wouldn't say another word. If they would open it and look at it, I would say, would you like me to tell you about it? But when they opened it and looked at it, that was like God saying, this one's really interested. Many would take it, put it in their pocket. Some would throw it in the trash can, whatever. But if they opened it and looked at it, I was thinking, well, they're interested. And so I would share with them more about Jesus loving them. Well, this is what happened here. She did exactly as he, as he had thought in his mind. God gave him the idea. And God was preparing everyone in this situation. In verse 21 and 22, we're going to see Eleazar present some of the gifts that are hers. Now look in verse 21 and 22. It says right here, Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful. Then it came about when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing ten shekels in gold. I don't know exactly how much money that is. I'm just going to tell you, it's a lot. He gave her a ring and two gold bracelets. Now that in itself would have been quite a gift. But we know that it wouldn't have taken ten camels to carry that. He could have put that in his pocket. And ten camels more was about to be hers. But with the ten camels more, that was a drop in the bucket to what was actually hers. I'm going to show you how God does. God gives this at the beginning, and it seems wonderful. But God gives the best stuff last. He gives the best stuff last. I just can't hold this back. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. He didn't just give all that he had. I'm telling you what he gave, what the Father gave. He gave his Son. He gave his Son. All that he had meant nothing compared to the Son, but he gave the Son. Jesus is yours. We're going to see how that she was also a gift for his Son. Now this is amazing. You are a gift for Jesus. Think about that. And he's a gift for you. You're a gift for each other. You're one. Can't be separated. Eleazar found out that she is Abraham's brother's daughter in verse 23 and 25, 23 through 25, and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milcah, whom, whom she bore to Nahor. Again, she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Now she's going to put that whole crew up. Amazing. And look in verse 26. Now this is big. Look in verse 26. A simple verse that if you're reading the Bible, you'll skip over it. But look in verse 26. Then the man bowed low and worshipped Yahweh. Notice he's not talking about the God of Abraham anymore. He bowed low to worship Yahweh because Yahweh is showing himself really big right here. In verse in verse 30, and we're kind of moving quickly now. The family's going to see some of the gifts. It came about when, the, when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist. This is Laban. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. Can you imagine that conversation? What you got in those camels? Oh, I've got millions of dollars worth of gifts for your sister. Really? Tell me about it. And he starts showing him stuff, and he's thinking, man, this is really something. And in verse 35 through 41, we see telling of God's plan for taking a bride for his son. Look in verse 35, and I know I'm moving now, but that's okay. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, Yahweh, has greatly blessed my master so that so that he has become rich and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age and has given him all that he has. Now notice, he's given to him all that he has. How much is Rebecca going to be given? Everything. That's right. Okay. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. 
I said to my master, Suppose the woman does not follow me. And he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful, and you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath. When you come to my relatives, and if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. God gives gifts. God makes a pledge. Our only part is to receive what He's given. We receive, He gives. Eleazar brought the gifts, the pledge, the down payment. Ten camels full. Now here it is. Sometimes it's really easy to get caught up in the down payment. Sometimes it's really easy to get caught up in what we've been given. Am I for gifts that God has given His people? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm telling you, what God has given you, I want you to listen. Some people struggle with this. What God has given us, and when He gave it, is so much bigger than we can even imagine. And today... When we start talking about the gifts that God's given us, and some people say, well, that's not for today, I just want to laugh. I want to say, not only is it for today, friend, but it is so much bigger than even you think it is. If you knew how big it was, you really would have a problem. I'm telling you the gifts that God has for you that are already yours, that it's going to take eternity for Him to reveal to you, it's mind-boggling. So much so that we couldn't even know about it now. If he tried to explain to Rebecca all that was going to be hers or that all that was hers, she couldn't handle it. All she could handle in the beginning were two bracelets and a ring. If he'd have shown her the ten camels full of stuff, it's like a kid at Christmas. They start opening presents and dumping them. Give me the next one. They open another one. Give me the next one. Open another one. But if you just gave them one, they'd play with it. Most of the little guys that I know, if you gave them the box that it came in, they'd play with them. They don't care about that. God has given her so much stuff, and so has He given you so much stuff. Easy to get caught up in the gifts, though, but she didn't. She was not living in the land she was going to reside in. She was going to go to Canaan, her new home. When Where we are now is not our home anymore. Our home, you say, well, our home's in heaven. No. No. Our home is wherever Jesus is. Wherever Jesus is, that's our home. The husband is the one who takes the wife. The wife goes. Wherever the husband goes, the wife goes. One of the reasons I see people that struggle with marriage is because the wife literally does not realize that she's in the husband and the husband's in her, and wherever he is is the right place for her to be. <coughs> well, wherever her husband is, that's home. We are the bride of Christ. In verse 50 through 58, we're going to jump down here. We're going to see that she had to receive the gifts and believe. And we're going to go down to 58. Then Laban, who was her brother, and Bethel, father, replied, The matter comes from the Lord. Okay, they were ready to receive that. So we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebekah, before you take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Let me read that again. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. It came about when Abraham's servant heard their words, that he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. Does it again. Oh God, you are really something. Verse 53, the servant brought out articles of silver. Now they're really starting to show her some stuff, show them some stuff. Articles of silver, articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave, look at this, precious things to her brother and to her mother. You see, the blessing doesn't just stop with you. It spills all over those that you love. Verse 54, then he and the men who were with him ate and drank, spent the night, when they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to, your ma to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days and say, Ten, afterwards she may go. And he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the girl and consult her wishes. Now look at this. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Let me talk about the significance of this, I will go. 
The going is not the significance. She'd never seen the master, Abraham. She'd never seen the son, Isaac. But you know what? She was drawn by Eleazar and the gifts. She was drawn by the Spirit. But here's what, here's what Rebecca did. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Here's what Rebecca did. She believed Eleazar. You believe the Holy Spirit. You believe that what the Spirit has said that God the Father and God the Son has given you is so. And you believe it. Were the gifts already hers? They were hers. They'd been given. But she said here, I will go. This is saying, I believe you. I believe you. Isn't this big? It's really big. All right. She said, I will go. She received and believed all that was given her. She believed him for what she saw. That's pretty easy. There was no denying there were ten camels full of gifts. She believed for what she saw. But I'm going to tell you something much bigger. She believed him for what she could not see. She believed him for what she could not see. You know what that is? That's faith. She placed her faith in what the Spirit told her. Verse 49, again, let me go back to 49. So now if you're going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. The servant brought the gifts. She had to say, yes. Now, do I understand this? Not really. I just know that, that this is what was said. The greatest gift... And the one that's overlooked the most is not the gold, the silver, the clothing, the houses, the camels, the swimming pools. It's not that. The greatest gift is not the ability to speak, see, hear, understand. It's not that. To heal, touch. It's not that. The greatest gift given is the fact that he gave his son to Rebecca. Isaac was hers. The greatest gift for you is that literally the Father has given you the Son. All that is His is yours. The Father gave all that was His. Who means more to the Father than the Son? Nobody. But He loves you so much that He gave His Son to you. Now this is really big. This shows, now I don't understand this, and I don't think anybody can until we, till we find out personally, face to face. What a big deal this is. He loves you. Now this is unreal as much as He loves the Son. That's how much He loves you. Your uncle now knows things you don't know. You explained it to him before he died and he believed you. <coughs> but now he understands things that you don't understand on this side. One day you will. But now he knows. Even bigger than what she said. The Father gave all that was His. There is nothing left to give. For us to think that God could do something else later is ridiculous. There is nothing else to do. It is finished. Those three words are so much bigger than we can understand on this earth. And it, it grieves me when I hear people trying to make it smaller than what it actually is. It's finished. The son did not share it with the bride. The son didn't share all that was his with the bride. He didn't share it with the bride. The son gave all that was his to the bride. Big difference. If I have a candy bar and you say, I like candy bars. And here, I'll give you half. Yeah, I'll give you half. That's not what he did. It's like saying, I like candy bars. And say, here, take, take this one. Say, well, but you won't have one. Yes, but I'll have great pleasure in watching you eat it. Jesus literally gave all that was His to the bride. All that belonged to, Re to uh, Isaac was now belonged to Rebekah. The bride did nothing to earn it. She simply received it. That's all. We're going to see in verse 63 through 67 how Isaac received his bride. The Bible says that Isaac met Rebekah and loved her. Now let me ask you this. What had Rebekah done to be loved by Isaac? Nothing. 
Isaac loved Rebecca before he knew her name. Because he didn't know her name. They didn't have telegraph back then. They didn't have telephone too far to send up a smoke signal. They didn't send a runner on ahead. They, they couldn't do any of that stuff. They didn't do an email. They didn't do a text message. But Isaac had determined that he loved her before he ever saw her. That was good when he did see her. And here's his first word when he saw her. Whoa! Whoa, man! She looks good! That might not have been his first word. That might have been his second word. But I'm sure the thought crossed his mind. Okay. Verse 63. Let me read 63. Isaac went out to meditate. I like this. He was meditating on his future bride. Now, as far as he was concerned, she was already his bride. He was meditating in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. I can hear it now. Camels are coming. Oh, boy. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. I'm sure that when she saw Isaac, she said, Whoa! I didn't know what he was going to look like, but he looks good. That's what you girls got waiting for you. <laughs> Whoa! I mean, she looks good, Daddy. He sees the gifts. He's going to say, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but the fact is, she was as excited as, as Isaac was. They're, they're mutually excited. And that's the way it is with us. They're mutually excited. And she said to the servant, who is that man? I'm sure she said it with the expectation. Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? I'm sure she had a big grin on her face. Could that be him? And the servant said, He is my master. Oh, man. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Do you realize, I don't understand this, going on with the symbolism and the parallel here, Jesus is comforted by you. You say, well, he comforts me. Yes, he does. But you comfort him too. That's amazing. Isaac met Rebecca. We were prepared for Jesus. Rebecca was prepared for Isaac. She was pure. We are pure because of the cross. I want to go over to to Romans 5, 17 and 18. I've read these verses to you before and to you out there and wherever you are. I've probably read these verses to you, but I want you to see these verses in this whole chapter. In fact, the whole New Testament. Look at this. Romans 5, 17. For by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace, all that there is, and the gift of righteousness given will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Verse 18. So then, is through one transgression there result in condemnation to all men. Look at this. Even so, through one act of righteousness there results justification of life to all men. What do you have to do with that? Nothing. That's given even before you believe it. Even if you don't believe it, it's still given. Now, can you live like it's not yours? Could, could Rebecca have rejected all that was given to her? She could have. She could have. I don't understand that. But I'm telling you, it was already hers. And I'm going to talk about us some more and how this relates to us. We must believe. This does not mean that all men are saved. They must believe. But I want to say this. We are prepared as virgins. I don't care what our background is. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your background is. It does not matter anymore because of the cross. You've been given the justification of life to all men. Those aren't my words. You have a problem with it? I'm sorry. Righteousness has been given to all men because of the cross. Struggle with it if you must, but it's easier to receive it. And believe it. We are virgin spiritually because being made righteous at the cross. Jesus loves us. He loves us for eternity and He loved us before we knew Him. Last thing I'm going to share. We are a gift from the Father to the Son. The Father sent the Holy Spirit to receive a bride for His Son that He loved. You are a gift from the Father given to the Son.
Is that big? I think that's pretty big. We are the pearl of great price. That's us. We did not first choose Him. He chose us. We choose to receive what He has already given is ours. We are His and He's ours. And I want to say this. I want to say it again. Remember this. This is not by chance, but it's by choosing. Not by chance, but by choosing. When we see the bridegroom, our focus will no longer be on the gifts. Right now, we see the gifts. But once we see Jesus, the gifts won't matter. She wasn't thinking about the gifts when she saw Isaac. She was just thinking about Isaac. The gifts are ours, but they'll be secondary. So far back in the distance, it's like it won't even matter. It's already given. Will you receive and will you believe? Some people call that being born again. That's what I'm going to call it because Jesus did. I'm going to tell you that's how Jesus feels about you. That's how God the Father feels about you. The Holy Spirit was sent to woo you. Will you receive Him? Will you believe Him? Will you realize that you have been wonderfully made created in His image, literally for the express purpose of becoming the Bride of Christ.